everybody. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, lots of familiar faces here today. And I know that a few people have brought a few people along with them, um, partly because of the topic, partly because they listened to this week's episode. Um, and we got lots of comments on this week's episode. I think it felt different, certainly to our usual episode, because the comments that we got back, um, definitely were using different words. We get words like, that was practical and that was useful. This week we got words like, that was profound. This feels life-changing. My mind Hel is blown. <laughs> yeah, my mind is blown. And Helen and I were like, oh, maybe we need to be a bit more profound, but I think we're just, we'll stick to the practical and we'll leave the profound to um, Sam and Catherine. So uh, all we are going to do this morning um, is just introduce you uh, to Sam and Catherine, who you can see on your screens now. Some of you will have listened to the podcast. As always, if you've not listened to it, don't worry. There's no test. There's no stress. But we just thought, um, given the topic, rather than us try and do our usual pod plus, we would get the experts themselves uh, to come and talk to you, uh, just to have a chat with you a bit about uncertainty for the next half an hour or so. So Sam, Catherine completely it, it's your the floor the zoom is yours thanks thanks very much um good morning everyone thank you very much for joining in and i got sent forwarded some of the comments um that are around it so thank you very much and that does seem to be our experience on this whole journey we don't always know what it is that we've unlocked um and there is a, a degree of experimentation to this whole thing it came from a really honest and natural place as i said on the on my my progression of the podcast and for us and our journey Catherine was exploring uncertainty for her professional reasons. I was exploring it for my professional kind of crises. And as we've unpicked this thing more and more, we're led towards it by the responses of people we've, we've, we've had heard. You know, it really was just a workshop and the demand was so great, it had to become something more. The community that came out of it were because they refused to leave the end of the last episode. So we're really being drawn into it. So I would be really interested to continue to hear what it is about the topic that you find most useful. You know, or, or either <laughs> intriguing and the questions that people have asked us really you know I'm learning an awful lot about science and the thing that you've taught me is that science isn't about answers it's about questions it's about questions yeah and actually the, the process for me has been amazing because you know so much of the work on certainty has until this point been done in labs which is really unrealistic and also mainly sort of men because it tends to be men in the labs who just test themselves and so it's really been really exciting to get the feedback has fed the science so much understanding like what's happening in the real world first with the uncertainty experts themselves and then everyone who came on the experiment and that data is now going back to UCL to actually sort of actually unlock the mechanisms and people are going oh okay this is what's happening so the questions are as important at this point as the answers to genuinely like expand the science around this. And so we're trying not to design anything that's too fixed so the, the, the series one that's going to go live in November is, is really quite different um, from the first episode. And it's mm. really based on the criticism, feedback, and again, the questions that people were having. So, you know, I think what we're saying is thank you for giving the floor to us, but we'll also try and give it to you for the most difficult, confusing, complex, and really simple and basic questions around it as well, because it, it has a polarity to be able to be both those things. It is at once quite complicated and uh, you know, interconnected and sits behind lots of the challenges we face, as well as the emotional upheaval of anxiety and exhaustion. And then it's also quite simple because uncertainty scares us at a really base level and fear is pretty horrible. And we have discovered, or we think we're discovering some pretty robust techniques for tackling, you know, the, the simple things like fear and the difficult things like the interconnections yeah. of complexity. I think that's all about a toolkit. And I think actually Sam was the person who, who redirected me as, as a scientist because he was the first person to say to me, well, uncertainty is also a feeling. And I was like, aha, uh -huh. because I'm like, well, uncertainty is a neural pathway in the brain and all this. I was like, no, it is a feeling actually. And it's, you have like external uncertainty, but also internal uncertainty. Like I'm the most indecisive person in the world. And for me, actually, it's been more about tackling my internal uncertainty. I'm quite good with the external uncertainty. So it's really interesting sort of the different things that, that we've learned. And I think um, I'll pick up on a really nice question from Elizabeth Blakelock. Do you think there is something about 2021, which is powering the impact these ideas are having? I'm not sure if we've been ready to hear this message in 2019. I think you're fundamentally right. Uh, I think the, the World Uncertainty Index, it turns out, has been around for uh, years. Yeah. I was totally ignorant of it. I didn't know. And I was talking about how do we change things and where are the fractures where we might create change for years? And I didn't even, I wasn't even aware of it. Um, and I have seen and worked with the VUCA framework, which I'm sure lots of you will be familiar with. The world is volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. But that framework in itself does the same thing that Catherine just said. Of those four terms that we use in management, 
only uncertainty is felt as well. And that is the key to this moment. And I think key to Elizabeth's question, this is a moment for understanding us as human beings, as important as organizations. You know, human beings have come out of the last year and a half knowing that connection is all important to us, yet the majority of our connection is now through a different medium, and that might well remain for some time. So how do you maintain emotional and human connections in this new world is, is fundamental to it. And when I started seeing the, the briefs that I was getting from companies, kind of mid-2020, it was around how do we get people moving again? How do we get people feeling brave and resilient? How do we get people... And that just wasn't honest because if people are coming to meetings feeling scared, you know, you can come to work now, there's a language to say, I've got a degree of anxiety, you know, that's fine. But it's very hard to just say, I feel scared or I feel stuck you know, I've just run out of energy. You know, we haven't, we haven't evolved the lexicon of how we're able to express some of these base, you know, human experiences. And so our companies sometimes are forming strategies around a relatively surface level of description around some of this. And that's why I think it's, a useful and I think yes in 2021 we are getting to a more human expression of what uncertainty does to us and, and I was feeling my way around this but I didn't know the things you've taught me so like I mean I think the point around negativity bias would really speak to that yeah some of the I mean absolutely and it's interesting there's a comment there from Lucy saying that she sort of realized that in in parts of her life have been challenging it's been uncertainty and that was the sort of the starting point that actually we spend a lot of time trying to tackle anxiety but anxiety is actually a symptom um, at the end of the day and uncertainty drives a lot of it and what you learn is that yes there's very powerful ways to tackle anxiety from breath work to the whole range of things but actually there's sort of one step you can go behind and start to to change how you handle uncertainty and you know understanding the uncertainty tolerance scale is sort of boring and scientific but what's to me powerful about that scale is that you can change where you sit on it and that's learning the techniques that we sort of teach and I think you know the first one is negativity bias and there's you know an incredible uh, fact that we have about 60,000 thoughts a day and sort of 85% of them are negative and 95% of the same as the day before and yet only one to three percent of those worries come true and of those three percent that come true 80% we handle better than we thought we would and learn from anyway and it's sort of that's how big our negativity bias is and with the pandemic they've watched you know in lab tests people's negativity bias have swung from about one in ten which is one thought in every in every ten is 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 rational and the rest are slightly slanted towards our obsession with with thinking the worst is going to happen, which is just our brain's way of trying to keep us safe. And the moment they think it's about 200 to one, which technically means there's about seven minutes of the day when you're not assuming the worst. And just by simply sort of reframing that, like I started to say these, these things out loud that were going through my head, you know, that like you can't do this or it's going to end in this. And I realized like the voice in my head is like mean girl for mean girls. And I have to go like, no, it's just a suggestion. Stop being mean to yourself. And you think if you, we did a thing in the lab where we got people to say those thoughts, those negative thoughts out loud, and then to have an avatar say them back to them and everyone's like oh that's so mean you know if someone said those to your friend you'll just like start attacking them and I think just sort of even acknowledging and realizing that we have that and then starting to actually go okay well what about yes. positive <laughs> positive things and how can we put the more positive possibilities and shift it's very easy to, it was not easy but you can learn to shift your negativity bias so that it's just not so dominant in your brain all the time and I, I I just saw a request for those stats. I, I wrote them up because they blew my mind as well. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've, I've cited the university from where the research came from and I put it on Instagram a couple of days ago, but mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'll dig them out and share them with Sarah and Helen as well. Um, one of the ways that we've then seen uh, through the audience is reaction to this exact point, right? If there's only what, 15 minutes, seven to 15 minutes of a day when you begin to think, oh, maybe maybe, I'll, maybe there's something good will happen. Yeah. So one of the ways we've seen both from the uncertainty experts themselves, because we asked them all around fear, like how did they come to terms with fear? If we're going to talk about the honest emotional impact of uncertainty and all of their strategies kind of came down to one mechanism that you can use. And it was uh, validated by the data that you analyzed from the audience's experience. And it's kind of simply this, and it's the first time we hear it in the show is given to us by a, a guy who's known as London's number one gangster. So it, it comes from a pretty uh, robust road testing, let's say. And, and uh, you know, he's fully turned his life around. He now runs a social investment program for young black entrepreneurs in Brixton and, and you know, he's been doing great things for a lot longer than he was doing bad things. Um, but it's corroborated by Morgan, who was in prison and is now a human rights activist and many others. And the idea is to, when you recognize that it's fear, and it's hard to recognize fear sometimes because it so distracts us before you know it, we've got a glass of wine, or I've got a glass of wine in my hands or, or we've started a fight with someone else. But if you can stop and sense that actually there's fear within 
And then the, one of the best ways is writing it down. What is the fear that I'm facing and why is it giving me this paralysis or this sickness or this anxiousness? And then consider the regret that, that letting this fear overwhelm you would cause. So it's a short-term fear of the meeting I've got to go to later and I'm scared of it because I'm, I'm, I don't feel fully prepared or I'm a bit out of my depth or, or there's a difficult relationship. The long-term regret would be that I really let myself down, that I don't get to make the presentation as well as it could, that that doesn't then mean the project begins or I don't get the promotion or whatever. The long-term regret is far, far worse than the short-term fear. And then when you bring, you know, you, you take that long-term regret back from the future and you put it next to the short-term regret, which is going to happen in an hour from that, the short-term fear, and all of a sudden the short-term fear is diminished, mm. almost to the point that it's, it's become simple to be able to move through it. And when we asked this of the audience in, in one of the early episodes, there's a question around great fears. And 85% of the audience said their greatest fear was a fear of failure. Yeah. And then there's a question that's posed to everyone by an ex-prisoner of war who faced his own mortality. And he asked people to consider what their greatest regret that they most want to avoid would be. So like picturing a later stage in your life and what regret do you not want to have? And it's like 90% of the audience, I think, said that the regret they wanted to avoid the most was missed opportunity. Mm. And now that's exactly these things coming together, right? Fear of failure is the one thing that's most likely to lead to missed opportunity. And one of the ways through this, when we suddenly are stopped by the fear of failure in front of us, is to consider the opportunity we might miss. And that the fear is never going to be absent, but we can pull our ways through it. And sometimes we can even put it behind us to push us forward. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point as well. Sort of, you know, fear is never going to be absent. And I see a question there about sort of how do you do it when, when you're sort of fatigued? And we're all brain fog is a really real thing, and it's a really pandemic-based thing because attention is a limited resource in your brain, and what takes up a lot of attention is is sort of panic and attention on things that are negative in the world around us. And there is a lot. Like our brains are pretty much attuned. Anything around illness or sickness, they sort of take on board for your survival. And our brains are overloaded, and we've had a very mm -hmm. low level stress response, which means like like cortisol in your body at a higher level everyone's heart rate is slightly up just because of course there is you know our bodies are responding to the world around us uh, and it does tie you up and it does fatigue you um and sort of you know fear people who well, there's this word emotional resilience which is a bit deceptive because it makes me feel like my mother telling me that you know you know it's, there's no need to cry sort of thing and emotional resilience isn't about not not feeling emotions it's about actually understanding there's the fear response it's trying to tell you something what it's about can i take it out of my unconscious reaction state where we go into this default where we react often to uncertainty and panic let our negativity bias take over um, and then that just leads us down this road to sort of safety behaviors glass of wine you know avoidance um let's throw myself into something else or at that point to acknowledge the fear. And it's what we call sort of mastering the fear. And so once you sort of go to your brain, okay, I've got it, the amygdala, the emotional part of the brain sort of kicking off, then you sort of have this pause in this moment where you can actually start to control the fear. And then sort of, it's called cognitive restructuring. And then you can think around it and go, okay, but I still want to get to, to that point. What are the positives? And you can sort of think yourself, beyond that step. And actually what they found is that once you get used to the feeling of fear, because annoyingly the feeling of fear makes you feel even more afraid and then you go in this sort of negative spiral and then you sort of spiral off the road but actually once you get used to that feeling and then also the feeling of this sort of cognitive dissonance when things aren't as bad as you think sort of then you 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 expand your muscle for tolerating uncertainty and those little steps and you know start really small little things that that figure out i i panic sometimes if like a plan changes or they're going we're going to a different restaurant but actually sitting with that and going okay this is okay it's like a muscle it gets stronger and stronger and then you can head towards the bigger things and the uncertainty experts they did nothing unusual they would just they had just through exposure become used to that feeling of fear but knowing how to sort of walk beyond it to this sort of place of opportunity and because you're highly aroused in your body which fear and excitement is the same thing in the body exactly the same thing the only difference is one chemical cortisol and the fact that you think something bad is going to happen it's like roller coasters if you love them it's great if you think you're going to die terrible um and so once you're in that high arousal state your brain also has the ability to absorb loads of information so actually you're suddenly in this position where you can be your best you can absorb most you can learn most you can grow most so it is this sort of backhanded opportunity uncertainty to also sort of be your best human i think there's some really good um comments coming through here that have, have helped me in the way that on my journey of this, because I, I really suddenly felt I was onto something new as I'd, as I'd met the uncertainty experts and I was communicating their stories like, ah, oh, you know, I've cracked something, you know, I've seen the crack and this can really help people. Um, and then, you know, met and started doing some more research and I saw Elizabeth Gilbert's incredible work and that of um, Lisa Phillips, 
brilliant neuroscientist. Um, and then Dr. Ming, the computational neuroscientist who was one of the uncertainty experts, having gone through gender transition, she was able to overcome the anxieties in her life. And then of course, Catherine, I mean, this, the range of fantastic female scientists that educated me to realize that this is primal and this is protection and this is who we are and it's how we respond, but it was intended, the, the systems within us, for short-term threats, you know, to deal with the classic mm. saber-toothed tiger scenario. Yeah. And what we are now in is the body is responding to this prolonged, what it understands as a threat. And that's why it's becoming exhausting and overwhelming. Mm. These systems were designed for short bursts of response. They were not intended for this long-term response. And that's why, even though this is long-term wisdom and understanding, now there is a need for a different response. Because if we now know that this level of chemical release in our bodies uh, is, is prolonged because this threat isn't going away, we need to learn to respond to it in a very different way. And that's really the big opportunity that all the science shows, and Elizabeth Gilbert and, and I would point to, two and a half thousand year old Buddhist wisdom, which says exactly the same thing, that we must make friends with our hopes and fears. Because otherwise the, the negative effect on our bodies and brains is, is going to be huge. But the reverse is also true. And it, all of the research also points to these heightened state of arousal to mm. push us into a place of, of learning and creativity, adopting new patterns and behaviours, even spending time with people that we find it difficult to be around over time will increase our perspective of the world. It will increase our patience. It will increase our tolerance for others. And this isn't just stuff that we need or we need at work. This is stuff society needs. Because un an intolerance to uncertainty pushes us to, to want answers more quickly, to, to mm. get to conclusions. Yeah. It doesn't allow us to stay in the nuance. And how many times in this country alone have we gone for the, the quick fix, the binary answer, when we needed to stay in the nuance and understand the complexity and difficulty of something to get to the best decision for complex times? This is not a time for yes and no, yeah. in or out answers. And there's a thing that sort of sticks to me is that when we feel on unsafe in uncertainty and not used to it we tend to to go towards people like us and that's sort of terrible in, in working things and we know that creativity and collective intelligence is all about embracing diversity of sort of ideas and perspectives and there's a really nice comment there from, from Kat Greenwood about you know understanding that fear is there but it needs to go in the back seat and it's very much like that and what's been really interesting is I think there's a tendency for people to think like I must not feel emotions I must be rational about this if you if you disable the part of the brain with the, the amygdala which handles emotions people can't even decide what type of breakfast they're sort of lost in decision making and what we've realized is we've just got out of balance and you know there's the amygdala which is all the emotions and the prefrontal cortex which is all the rationality and they need to be in balance that's when you're at your best when you're actually using your rational thought but also your feelings and like this you know we're coming back to this idea in science that actually we also feel things and our gut intuition you know we can get better at knowing when it's right or wrong and balancing those two and using not just our mind but also our emotions as, as a really good guide and it is a bit like that you know when you get overwhelmed the middle it does get in the front seat of the car and that's all the emotions and it does it can't drive for shit it goes straight off the road um but if you just have the prefrontal cortex and no emotions you just don't really know where to go so it just sits there happily just like driving on the freeway so you've got to sort of try and balance those two things and i think we are entering this and the one good thing the pandemic we're entering a place where we do talk about emotions more and actually they are really important in decision making you, what you were saying made me think of the work we were doing yesterday for the other part of it which was pulling out putting out those kind of oh, yeah, takeaways. Yeah. And, you know, seeing as we were so profound on the podcast and, that, and actually <laughs> the challenge is to be practical, <laughs> yeah. um, we've done some thinking and the questions and uh, Catherine's response just made me think about it. And we pulled out a couple of what we think are the key takeaways that we've that we've heard so far. So seeing as we've only got eight minutes left, should we, should we share some of those? Yeah, soon. What's right. your favourite? It's my favourite. Um, well, it will pick up on the, on the question there, which is how do we really ex increase our tolerance to uncertainty? So... One of the ways that we phrase this, and it comes throughout all of the um, interviews we've done, is as, as adversities can become superpowers. Now, I know superpowers can sound a bit lame, but it was the phrase that nearly all the experts used. And if they didn't use superpowers, they used sixth senses. And it's not because superheroes have capes. It's because they have origin stories. If you think of all of them, it's being bitten by a spider or, you know, the loss of something terrible. Um, uh, and, and it's because of something called predictive processing. Our brains are prediction machines. For, actually, this is your territory. So no, tell me no, no. Right. Yeah. Our brains are predictive machines constantly working out what's coming next in millions of, of processes in, in every single hour. And when things go wrong and they don't predict accurately, they get really upset. And when they predict correctly, they give us little dopaminic rewards. So if you can find or explore the benefits of uncertain situations and record them, perhaps write them down or discuss them, your brain will adapt 
and it will fear challenging situations less and begin to recognize them as opportunities to learn more. So literally, if we reframe our attitude to tough times, we will be able to live out that saying, whatever doesn't kill us makes us stronger. But rather than always view that retrospectively, we might be able to view it proactively. Mm. And I think that's, that's really fabulous. And actually, it, it leads on. I was going to talk about negativity bias. We've talked about that. And there's a question just popped up that I really like, uh, which answers to one of the top tips, which is sort of how can we help each other face uncertainty? And actually, one of the most powerful things we found in, in the experiment was the collective power. And now I do a lot of work looking at the importance of collective live experiences. When we're, we, you know, we're not meant to be isolated, it's really bad for our mental and physical health. And we've all suffered from that this year. Um, but just being around people boosts this chemical called oxytocin, which makes you feel more at home, you, you trust people. And one of the most powerful things was doing it with other people. And, and once sort of everybody started to put their hand up and say, actually, I'm really afraid of uncertainty, everyone else did as well. And that became this very sort of powerful movement. And everybody was like, oh, okay, because I think we, we, we're terrified of having these feelings, you know, we're meant to be okay. And, you know, and, and once that collective group started to acknowledge it, and I think that was really powerful, watching people actually say, I'm really worried about this, I'm really struggling with uncertainty, and doing it together. Um, and I think there's a power in that. But there is, and it's, you know, the power in what Tanya just had the, the bravery to share. And, and the question that we ask on that one, and it's deliberately a difficult question, because this this work is difficult. Um, is what are some of what, what's the greatest adversity that you faced that you are proudest to overcome? And that's not to you know, try to find the you know try to find the silver lining and everything. Um, not to treat it as trite in any way. But what adversities have we overcome that we're proud of? Mm. And 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 in the show, I, I I spoke specifically about the divorce I'd gone through, which was a you know, traumatic and horrible experience, but. I, I wanted to be clear that in these moments, if we can, we can change our whole frame. So rather than the typical model would be to now fear that and therefore now to fear relationships and to, and to remove yourself a bit more because the brain has worked out that that situation was horrible and then it will put in protections. But my ex and I have discussed this at great depth. We've gone through therapy. We've, we've made sure our kids are okay. And now we can both proudly talk about it and we advise our friends who are going through difficult times. And then we can laugh about it as we did because we were each other's bubble over Christmas. And then you can reframe everything and your brain, you know, as you've taught me, it really is malleable and it will rewire itself yeah. to these things. So no matter how difficult the thing is, and I say this with some caution because you know, we all will respond to the, the sensitive and traumatic moments of our life in different ways, but it is proven the more time that we can spend with them and process them and try hard to see what the lessons are, Mm. we will shift our response when difficult things happen again yeah and i think the so neuroplasticity is like the, is, is the best thing in the world it's the ability for the brain to literally restructure itself so your what were once automatic reactions to, to uncertainty and to interfere suddenly you start to get these new roadways and the more you do them the more that becomes your natural response and you are the reacting you're acting in the way you want and someone has just put a name which i absolutely love in the in the chat which is sarah garfinkel because not only are we trying to get people to uh to sort of restructure you know the way they're thinking but the way they're feeling and one of the the things we, we, we go through in the first episode is interoception which is a very relatively new term and Sarah Garfield has been leading this research um and it's Sussex uh and it's about our ability to actually send signals from our body as well as our brain and and you know whether that's racing heart or you know butterflies in our stomach and you know again we used to separate the mind and the body but emotions we feel as well and, and our greatest decisions can be made when we get more aware and accurate at being honest to what our body's telling us and those feelings and what they're telling about its emotions, as well as what we're thinking as well. So yeah, go, go check out Interoception. There's been a great piece in The Guardian recently about it, explaining how it sort of feeds into our, our mental health. Uh, there's an even better piece of you uh, talking about it. I, I'll, I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll send that, that there's, Catherine just recorded something that's brilliant about Interoception, and which I will forward to Sarah, and I could also send it along with the top tips that we've written down and the other thing that's made possibly worth checking out is at uh uncertainty experts the, the site we've put up a, a short version of the need for closure scale so it's the scientific research on how to measure your tolerance to uncertainty it's a short version of the long um uh, assessments that we'll do in the program but Catherine and the team at UCL put it together so if you want a quick measure of your tolerance to uncertainty there's yeah. one that we've put up for free so you can try that out as well yeah, we're doing, ooh, two minutes. You do, you've done brilliantly, and um, I think we've we've done a really good job of. Um, this has felt so different to our usual pop pluses. <laughs> this really makes me. Usually, we're like, here's a matrix, three ideas for action, and it is. Um, here, I feel like we've 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 done much more about like life, and it feels much more transformational. Um, so anyway, I was I was so busy just thinking there. I was like, oh, what do we do now? 
Um, so everyone, I have already put in the chat, if you do want to join um, the interactive series, as I've described it in the podcast, it is, I think it's a learning experience, that's how I would describe it, but it's not like a learning experience that I've had before, um, which is why I'd encourage you to get involved. I got a bit involved in um, some of the pilot that Sam and Catherine ran earlier this year, and I'm really excited for the first series, so I'll put all the link there. Um, we will share with you, so after Pod Plus, as always, we send out a note with like the video and resources. I'll make sure we put the stats that Stan mentioned um, and any other articles or um, the piece that they mentioned around Catherine talking about. Am I saying it right? It, is it introception? Or in yeah, it's so new that even spell check doesn't get it. And being dyslexic, I can't spell it. Or yeah, say it. I keep what it's saying. I N T E R O. Yeah. I'm going to have to practice that because I won't say intro, which is not quite right. Um, any, um, oh, you can also buy a big gift card. Very good, Elizabeth. I feel like together we are um, basically doing a really good job of PRing Catherine and Sam on their behalf. Um, Catherine and Sam. Someone told me it wasn't working yesterday. It's next to my to-do list. So hold, hold on. I might have to make the gift card work. All oh, right. Okay. <laughs> the joys of experimenting. Us, us doing everything. But yeah, I'll go on the website and make the gift card thing work in a second too. Um, and so perhaps just to finish, to finish the um, days, and I know we asked for this for the podcast, but maybe we could just finish with both of you just sharing one bit of advice about uncertainty. So not necessarily the bigger career advice question that I asked you, but if you were just going to leave people with one bit of advice about uncertainty today on this Thursday morning, what would it be? So I think it's about learning, the, the biggest thing is the learning to listen to my body and my, my mind as well and sort of ground myself in the present. I'm a spiraler, I will spiral out of control in the face of uncertainty and let it overwhelm me. Someone said if there was like a collective name for me, it's like a herd of cows, it would be an anxious of Catherine's. Um, <laughs> and so for me, it's in when now when I face and surgery, the first thing I do before anything, I actually just ground myself and I listen to my brain and my body. And then I just remember it's just a suggestion and that sort of, it gives me that moment to just pause and reflect and then go from there. And I think that's been my biggest learning to just not react, but give myself a moment to, to actually gather myself before I act in the face of uncertainty. Um, and mine is uh, to the point Elizabeth Antigua made earlier on, how do you start to find your way through uncertain situations? My whole life I've just spent in my brain. My, I've totally seen my body as a vehicle for getting my brain from one meeting to another, to quote Ken Robinson. and. And this experience has taught me, and we all know that in technology, the brain has been outcomputed. Uh, technology can outthink, out probably out, out probabilize, outplay us at chess. But there are two decision-making frameworks in the body, and they are equally powerful and they are equally accurate. And the body's making decisions all the time, and it's and it's constantly picking up more data than the brain even can based on the eyes and all its kind of like usual um, functions. And when they work together and this is called embodied cognition that I'd never even heard of, you have a decision-making power like no other. So uh, Elizabeth Antigua's question was, how do you start to find your way through uncertain situations when reliable uh, information has disappeared, and that's how our brains make uh, decisions, we need to start relying on instinct, judgment, feelings. And when, when we get to a place where that decision-making process works with that decision-making process, all of a sudden we're in a new world. I'm certainly not perfect at it, but I've been beginning to feel and think together in yeah. a way that I certainly never ever have. It does work. And the other thing is it's just the thoughts that your negativity bias thoughts are just suggestions. That's what I have to tell myself a lot. <laughs> it's just I really like that. I'm a mean yeah. girl in my head. <laughs> <laughs> Don't let that inner critic creep in. They're just suggestions. <laughs> Turn down the volume, how's how I always think of it. Thank you. So Catherine and Sam, thank you so much. You've joined us from Spain this morning and I know you've got a massive conference to go and do. And we were like, of course you want to come along to Pod Plus. So we, and I know everyone in our community um, really appreciates it. There's been so much um, appreciation in the chat. Lots of people kind of saying thank you. Um, loads of people signing up for the uh, series, which is brilliant. And thank you all for joining as always this morning. I hope it's been a slightly different Pod Plus this week, um, but a really good start to your day. And I suspect it has been given how enthusiastic everybody is in the chat at the moment. Thank time. you all. Next week's about time, everyone. Oh, so yeah, it's time. Fast. And it'll, be, it'll be me. <laughs> That's what we need. <laughs> That's what we really need. <laughs> Bye, everyone. Cheers, Steve. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you very much Thanks a lot. Bye.